Good evening, everyone. I'm really pleased to be joined this evening by Kevin and Jane from Bristol West CLP, and Darren will be along with us shortly. So the theme of this evening is going to be democracy. I think democracy is fundamentally important to the running of the country and the Labour Party. I think there are so many challenges that we've seen over recent elections with the way democracy is being run in the country. And so many of the solutions that we need to implement in the country would be best found through giving people more power. So if we give more democracy to the people, I think that will help us achieve the fundamental changes that we need across society. So for me, I think it's absolutely essential that the Labour Party models that kind of democracy in action across the massive membership that we have. That's our way of showing the country you can trust us with your votes because we are operating that way internally and that's how we want to bring change to the country. So, of course, as a massive membership organisation, we work in units at CLP level and that democracy then becomes fundamentally important into shaping how the party is formed. So there have been some um, strange occurrences, shall we say, recently that we're going to discuss that I think are presenting some challenges to keeping our members um, motivated and enthused and able to actively participate. So we're focusing on Bristol tonight because they've recently had um, an AGM that has had some strange things happening that we're going to discuss. And I think that if we can overcome these challenges at a local level, we can start to reshape the party in the way that we want. And we're going to look at some positives as well as some initiatives and ideas that we have for you all to get involved later on in the programme. So first, if I can go to you, Kevin, if you can give us a little potted history of what's happened with this AGM that's recently been held. Why are people concerned about it? Hi, Jen. Um, hi. Well, in fact, the story goes back in some ways to November when the AGM of Bristol West CLP was meant to be held. Uh, not long before the AGM, several of the officers and other party members were suspended for the heinous crime of allowing discussion of a resolution supporting Jeremy Corbyn, who was subsequently, of course, found not to be uh, breaking the rules of the party. Those comrades still remain suspended to this day without having had any real hearing. In, on the eve of the annual general meeting, literally with 350 members registered, the regional office of the Labour Party pulled the plug on the meeting and took control of the constituency, shut down the executive committee and rescheduled the meeting for last week. Bristol West, of course, is uh, it's probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest constituency Labour Party in England. With a, a, well, so it had at one point four and a half thousand members. Unfortunately, some comrades have left in the last period, completely fed up with the manoeuvrings of the right wing leadership of the late. But anyway, the Reconvened annual general meeting was last Thursday night, and it was surreal, to put it mildly. You've got the, uh, one of the biggest constituencies in the country. There were 350 registered for the original AGM. Uh, regional office take control of the meeting. The officers of the party, and also the majority of the executive committee, approached regional office on several occasions and offered Despite our misgivings of them taking control of the party, we offered our support and guidance in running the AGM with the experience we had accumulated previously of how to handle meetings of 350 people or more on Zoom, which isn't within the remit of most people in the party. Not one single one of those approaches was responded to, including two emails signed by 12 members of the executive committee of all political persuasions completely and utterly blanked in a man manner of the man in a way of the most utmost arrogance towards party members was shown by the regional office. So here we are, fast forward to Thursday night, the annual general meeting. The meeting is, starts at seven o'clock and we're confronted with a blank screen and then the uh, regional party officer who's chairing the meeting, unelected, unappointed, well appointed by the regional executive behind the back of the party, announced his that the ballot papers will be issued shortly. There's no, no business of an annual general meeting, no minutes of the last meeting, uh, no point attempts by one, two comments to raise points of order were not even considered, which is against standing orders. There was no chat. There were no screens. It was run as a webinar. So all anyone could see was the, the uh, chair. No one could see anyone else in the meeting. Um, just a blank screen most of the time. 
So at seven o'clock, the chair comes on and announces that shortly the ballot papers will be distributed. No statements, the state, the no chance for candidates to make a short statement to be seen on screen by the other members. So clearly the sole purpose of this was just to get a vote and get it done. A little bit late, and he said, because there's so many people, it'll take a while and the papers will be distributed and by about half past seven. Okay, fine, that's fine. Time edges on, come half past seven, and there's announcements then, oh, some members have got their ballot papers, but loads of people clearly have not got their ballot papers. Oh, because there's so many people, it's taking longer than we thought. Well, there was no surprise that there was 500 people in the meeting, given there'd been 350 pre-registered for the previous AGM. It transpires that what they'd done was had, they had no pre-registration, despite the advice from the officers I mentioned, which meant they were trying to match the records, membership records, checking people are paid up, of 550 people against a list of four and a half thousand on the fly. <laughs> I mean, call it what you like, call it incompetent. I mean, you could say, oh yeah, well, that's, that's really difficult. Well, it would have been really difficult if they didn't know it was gonna be the case in advance. And, you know, they, they, and then there were further problems. And it, in the end, I mean, it, it just got ridiculous how long it was dragging on. Eight o'clock, every half an hour you'd come on screen and say, sorry, it's taking longer than we thought, bear with us. And then later on, they started to blame the Anani voter voting system. And we think it hasn't, the truth's not out yet, but it transpires the Labour Party had only signed up to use a Anani voter for 300 votes or participants. Despite the fact 350 people had registered for the previous AGM days before it even started. So they obviously in, in the background were trying to do some deal with an voter or set up another ballot and then presumably add the two together. The final ballot papers were distributed. Well, no, no, the final people received ballot papers somewhere around half past 11 at night. And the results were announced at 12 o'clock. And even then, not everyone had actually received ballot papers. We know a member of, for example, the partner of an EC member, who, or a ward EC member, who hadn't received a ballot paper and was in good standing. So it was complete and utter shambles, undemocratic. There were two observers appointed apparently randomly, although no one has sight of how they were appointed, but perchance probably one representing each of the two slates of candidates in the meeting. They were not consulted at any point in this farrago from seven o'clock until midnight. This first, the, the, both of them made several representations through the Q&A to be consulted. The sole uh, consultation was to be presented with a list of votes immediately before it was announced. To this day, they've, they've sent an email, as I understand, to regional office. To this day, regional office has made no contact with the observers. Three days later, and the ballots themselves, I mean, one of them, for example, for treasurer later in the day, probably when they had to rejig the ballot to cope with the number of people, for Jane, who was standing for treasurer, um, had two names on one line of the two candidates from different wings of the party with one box. Can I just screen share to show you this? Yeah, sure, let's have a look. I hope this works. It's a bit beyond my pay grade. I mean, uh, we've used uh, a non-voter for um, ward yeah, selections for councillor candidates. Yeah, that's it there. So I appreciate it's not always the easiest system to use, but mm. clearly you can't cast a vote there for the but, candidate. You want to, can you? There's, um, there's a bit of an issue if you want to vote. Who are you actually? Who's that vote going to get credited to if someone casts it? That's the question, isn't it? Um, so the word farcical springs to mind. So I can appreciate these things might be difficult and especially the idea of checking people off live in the meeting. Um, in, in my CLP, people were fraught about 10 people coming to a meeting that weren't actually pre-registered. So we were really wanted to make sure that it was well organized because it's not easy to do. But when there are that many anomalies going on, I'm just, I'm a bit unclear why this hasn't been followed up on yet, but before, maybe perhaps before we come to that, thanks for that um, summary, Kevin. Maybe Jane, if you could tell us, how does it feel for you? Is it the candidate for treasurer seeing your name there next to one box? How does that feel? Like, do you feel like democracy has been stolen from you? <laughs> well, certainly democracy is not, is not shining there, is it? I think we can quite safely say that that is not going to secure me a safe vote 
when my name is presented like that on the ballot paper. I mean, just to sort of echo what Kevin was saying there, I mean, it, it felt quite dystopian, really. I mean, it's um, whether, and of course, what's everybody now, you know, there's lots of chat amongst us all, as you can imagine, well, um, as to what, what on earth happened. And people saying, was it shenanigans? Was it incompetence? Was it a mixture of the two? And, and you can understand why people do not have faith that, uh, that this was just not um, a technical glitch. This went beyond a technical glitch. It was, it was a sort of a blithe disregard for democracy, I'd say. So the, the fact that they had two months to prepare for, for this and they really screwed up so badly. And the next day, I mean, they, they, they said, the, the chair said at the end, you will receive notification of the votes. He read out the votes and said, you'll receive notification by email tomorrow. They came sort of mid afternoon the next day there was absolutely no mention in that email about the whole debacle that was that voting procedure. I mean, it's as if it didn't happen. It was Kafkaesque. It was dystopian. Uh, but, you know, when incompetence, yeah, definitely incompetence. But I think it does beg questions as to uh, malintent. I really do think that. Um, and I know... I mean, as somebody who was on the on the left slate, who worked hard to pull that slate together, as somebody who was involved in the ring rounds beforehand to get the vote out, I think. Oh, I've lost my thread here. <laughs> I th I think it was. Um, oh, sorry, Jen. I've lost my thread. No, <laughs> sorry okay. about that. It was, me, it was just making me think as you were saying that about how this must feel for people in your CLP, like uh, the least I would expect now is if there are questions ever around democracy, that we just look into it as quickly as possible to restore the reputation of the party and the trust of our members in how we're operating. So where there are questions around a hundred people yeah. not being able to cast their vote, the idea that the email comes out the next day and it doesn't make explicitly mm. clear to all of the membership look, there have been some anomalies we need to rerun or we need to investigate or we need to speak to our observers and find out what's going on. It seems to me quite odd that's not been the case yet. And I'm hoping that this programme will in part prompt people to think maybe yeah. we do need to look again at what's going on here for everybody. And actually, I mean, if I, could, yeah, yeah. if I could come back on that, am I surprised? I mean, I think there was there were concerns before the evening um, it sort of given the background of the suspensions, given the background of everything that happened with Jeremy Corbyn, there were concerns that it would not be a fair due process. So we anticipated some problems, nothing of the um, like the order that um, the problems actually rolled out. But yeah, if you look at uh, this, this is not peculiar to Bristol. It is happening elsewhere in the country. Look at the whole process of what's happened with the leadership of the Parliamentary Labour Party, the NEC. You know, the, the, what happened in Bristol reflects the bigger picture. You know, and you you rightly were saying, Jen, in your introduction, that we we've got to push for democracy. I mean, I think it's it's not just democracy; it's the policies that go with it because. Democracy falls apart when um, when the when the leadership starts unraveling the, the the socialist manifestos that we agreed at at national conference. So it's it's nothing. I, I think you can't look at it divorced from the policies that the leadership is fighting on or not fighting on. I would say in this current situation. So I don't see it as an organisational issue. I see it primarily as a as a political issue. Just uh, perhaps just I, I just say that I mean, in a sense, the immediate organisational issue in Bristol West flows directly out of a political standpoint. You know, yes, there were cock ups on the night, no question about it. But those cock ups came out of the determination of the leadership, not just of the mm. regional office in Bristol 
where they were clearly taking orders from David Evans and the leadership of the party nationally in the NEC, and their determination to basically carry out a witch hunt, a purge, a civil war against the left of the party. You know, whether it's long, Rebecca Long Bailey being ditched in the shadow cabinet, Jeremy Corbyn being suspended, the suspensions mm-hmm. taking place up and down the country, a one-sided civil war is taking place. And in those conditions, the regional office clearly determined it wasn't going to, it was under no conditions going to listen to even good advice from local officers and party members. And therefore, the mistakes, you know, the actual practical mistakes occurred. So they didn't, yes, they may have been mistakes, but they didn't fall from the sky. They were rooted in a political circumstance, which is the battle that's going on at the top of the party and throughout the party, really, of the right wing trying to trying to push back the socialist programme at the heart of the Labour Party to try and make the Labour Party acceptable for capitalism in the future. Yeah, quite. And so the thing, the thing is with this, when we're relating it to the bigger picture and the changes mm. that are going on, I, I can really see that myself. So I was a, a parliamentary candidate and I, I felt like I had quite a good relationship with the regional office. They knew I was on the left. I, I suspect they largely aren't, but we never really had problems like that. But I have noticed a big change, mm. a big, big change since the leadership changed. And that worries me because that wasn't at all, as we know, the kind of platform that, that Keir stood on. But also to pick up on some of the points that you raised there, Kevin, I think that democracy brings out the best in everybody. It brings up those talents, you know, it allows people to flourish. So when um, people like Rebecca Long Bailey being forced out of the shadow cabinet, you know, we can see the problems that that has caused for schools because she was listening to the mm. unions and the amount of lives that might have been saved by her more mm. cautious and attentive mm. approach to listening to the unions just says to me you know we aren't on the right path there are grave consequences from taking this approach so at every level that we can from CLP level to um, the national level I think it's important that we try to put that democracy back in action and I also just want to say for the benefit of the, the listeners out there I I know these two wonderful people because they came down to help in Truro and Falmouth, but Bristol CLP, uh, Bristol West CLP actually supplied activists all around the region, particularly around Bristol, but in other areas, I mean, they can fill me on this, but literally there are thousands of them in Bristol and they went by the busload to help get MPs elected even. And I went up to a, a meeting, a momentum meeting in Bristol where there were activists that stood up at the front and they encouraged people to go and campaign for an MP that had completely lost the faith of the members in his own CLP because his views were significantly to the right of the membership. And the Momentum members were encouraging people to get that MP elected. So the political maturity from the left was absolutely without question. It was an absolute campaigning force that did the right thing for the party when it was needed. It seems to me that is not being repaid now in action when we should be an inclusive and welcoming party. It seems like the factionalism has now gone to such extents that things like this can go unquestioned. And that's what I want to challenge tonight. It can't be unquestioned. So we've just been joined by Darren. Um, I'm very pleased to have you with us, Darren. So we've covered over some of the events of the AGM um, if you're if you're happy to come straight in I, you were the secretary of um, the AGM so the people out there sorry the secretary of the CLP people out there might be thinking well the AGM had to be rerun it wasn't stuck to its original date because there were some questions over the running of or how the executive had run that and indeed I think that region have suggested that so what would you say to that do you is there any evidence to show that the executive weren't ready to run the AGM properly at the previous date well what happened was thus our CLP held a meeting uh after Jeremy Corbyn was suspended in which we discussed a motion which was passed by one of our branches which called for Jeremy Corbyn to be reinstated and just before that meeting happened, um, our chair and co-secretary were receiving correspondence from regional office telling them they weren't allowed to go ahead with this meeting. <clears throat> and there was some ambiguity and discussion over it because it's not clear in the rule book that there's anything wrong with doing that. And elected EC members are there to enact the democratic will of the members. That's what they're there for. So the meeting went ahead immediately afterwards 
our chair and co-secretary were suspended. I wasn't, and I, we did. We weren't sure why that was. But then I was. I was eventually suspended a couple of weeks later, just as I was about to send out an email to all of our members about our AGM, at which we were all going to step down, which included links to how to join the meeting and who the candidates were, etc. Um, so shortly after I was suspended, an email went out to all of our members from Southwest Regional Office, which implied that there was some wrongdoing, some malice and some incompetence amongst the EC, uh, which suggested that people weren't receiving the information about the AGM, which is false, or that the information didn't go out uh, during the, the amount of time, which is meant to be 28 days, which is false. Uh, and that the EC had just basically been conducting themselves improperly somehow. But they never contacted any member of our EC to kind of investigate any of these allegations or to ask us if any of them were true or to, to look into them in any way whatsoever. So after that email went out, members of our executive committee tried to contact regional office to ask them what was going on. And, and to, but they received no replies. The exact the regional office didn't reply to anyone's phone calls, emails, or text messages. Our branch secretaries found that they were also unable to conduct meetings, and they also had their access to organize to email their members and members let mm -hmm. to check members' details. They found that that was all revoked, and none of the branch secretaries were suspended. So they should all they were all members in good standing. And they had no idea why they were being prevented from conducting any business, holding any meetings, planning for campaigning for the local elections which are due to take place in mm -hmm. May, being able to kind of organize uh, election campaigns, being able to select candidates because there are still candidates that need to be selected in some of those seats. So all of this happened without explanation. And then our AGM took place on Thursday and all of the things that they have accused our executive committee of without any evidence or any investigation or any attempt to com communicate with us all of those things that they accuse us of are things that they themselves did several of our members received no information about the meeting they didn't even send out the details in, in, in the right amount of time several of the people couldn't join the meeting and lots of people received no ballots and at the end of the AGM which 540 people were in I think only about 420 people actually voted. So at least 100 people have been disenfranchised. After the meeting went on, it was due to take place from, people were due to log in at 5.30. It was meant to start at 7, and it should have been over by 8.30. And over the course of the evening, they continuously extended the period of time and said it will, it will, it will be a bit later, it will be a bit later. And in the end, the results didn't come until after midnight, by which time lots of people had given up. Lots of people had gone to bed. A lot of people had children to look after. A lot of people had work early the next morning. A lot mm. of people had issues, for example, disabled people who have been excluded from this process, essentially, because they weren't able to kind of stay up for a six and a half hour meeting. There's not even an explanation as to why people needed to vote in the period of time that the meeting took place. Why couldn't they have just extended the, the, the voting period and say, you've got 24 hours to vote, for example. Yeah. So this is what we're, we're facing now. So now we're gonna have to put in complaints. We're gonna have to try to hold an investigation. But it seems like the newly elected executive committee are satisfied with what's taken place. They don't, there doesn't seem to be any protest about it from them. Um, and nor does there seem to be any protest about it from our MP, Thang and Debonair who sent an email out to a select list of her favoured members recommending that they vote for the unity slate, which is the slate that won every position on Thursday. I wasn't sure that we're actually, they were actually allowed to do that. I, I might no. be confusing something else, but I thought that MPs weren't supposed to. I don't know. But I'm very disappointed, I have to say, with any members that are happy to let this stand. Like, it shouldn't matter where you see yourself politically aligned in the Labour Party. You should believe in democracy. So okay. it, the okay. people that won that slate, I can't understand why they're going ahead with it. Okay. So can I, can just can, actually, I, I, I picked up kind of background, you know, uh, comments off social media that there may be some discussion going on amongst the 
unity slates and the MP of you know that they also are unhappy with the way the meeting was run. Well, for goodness sake, everyone, any any sane human being should be unhappy with the way the meeting was run. What I'm concerned with the is that by all means, you know, if they want to object, that's great. But actually, they have no legitimacy in that objection until the observers have actually been consulted and had a chance to report. Who they have not been spoken to yet, the two observers, once by regional office. So any attempt by the new executive or the MP to make a sort of a complaint to cover their backside, you know, and appear to be looking after the members, frankly, is out of order until the observers have had their say. And we've heard from the representative of the GLU, the Labour Party's legal unit, who was present. We want a full report from them as to what they think this was a, a fair and proper procedure. But until, until the observers have reported, frankly, the, my view is the new EC, I mean, they may have got the larger vote in the meeting, that's true. But let, until the observers have reported, they have no legitimacy to act as an executive committee, and certainly not over the back and behind the observers. And yeah. also the other point, sorry, one of the little points been raised by one of those, one, I believe, and that is that all well and good if people want, you know, the, the MP and her friends want to make complaints now, mild complaints. Why weren't they complaining when our executive was suspended? Why weren't they complaining when council candidates of long standing, people like Darren, were suspended? Why weren't they complaining when Darren heard nothing about his suspension for two months from the Labour Party? Why are they only raising a mild complaint to kind of gild the lily on their election? Not yeah, brilliant. absolutely. And that was the point I wanted to come on to. So I think many people out there will be aware, Darren, that you were one of the people that was suspended from the Labour Party. And, and that has meant you've been unable to stand as a councillor candidate, although you were never informed that was the case. So could you just update us on that? Have, has anything been communicated to you about that? Are you being invited to stand now or not? So what's happened there is I was selected democratically by the members of Bishopston and Ashley Down Ward in a three-way competitive selection process in July 2019 um, <clears throat> to stand in that ward, which I was a member of. I was a member of that branch. Um, so after I was suspended, I received a letter informing me I was suspended, but with no specific allegations or evidence attached to it. So I replied to them to say, could you please tell me what the allegations against me are, what the evidence is? And they ignored me. They didn't reply to me. Then, so that, that was in the, tw the 20th of November. About a month later, I heard from the chair of the LCF in Bristol, the local campaign forum, who told me that someone from regional office had been in contact with him to say that they needed to set the process in motion to um, select a new candidate in my seat and also the seat of Anna Lark Green, who was standing as a candidate in Lockley's ward, which is nearby, who was also suspended. And the chair of the LCF refused to do that and said that that's going against the democratic principles of the party. And why would they why would they do that? Why wouldn't they conduct the investigation, uh, wrap up the suspension one way or the other, whatever the outcome is, wait for that to, to happen and then make a decision? And they told him they think that the process of the suspension investigation will take so long that it, it wouldn't be possible for us to stand in May. There's no reason for that. There's no explanation for that. So eventually I received a letter regarding my suspension two months later on the 20th of January. And I responded to that letter with a series of, they had a series of questions. Essentially, did you allow this meeting to happen? Did you allow a motion in support of Jeremy Corbyn to happen? That's, that's basically the substance of, of why I'm suspended. There's nothing else going on there. So I replied back to them, explaining, uh, answering all of their questions on the 26th of January, two days later, an email was sent out to all Bristol West members from Southwest Regional Office informing everyone that there is a vacancy in my seat and a vacancy in Lockleys where Anna Lock Reed was going to stand and that they were going to be selecting new candidates for it. At no point in this process has anyone from Regional Office been in contact with me and I have spoken to members of Bristol City Council Labour Group who are very upset about what's going on and I'm not talking about people who are like necessarily aligned with the Corbynite left. I'm talking about people from across the spectrum of the Labour Party because they can, they can recognise and they can see that this is going to be damaging to Bristol's local election chances 
because there's this big row happening. There's no justification for what's going on. And they can see it's going to create tension and bad blood within the party, which means people are going to be less enthusiastic about campaigning for the Labour Party in Bristol when it comes to May. So since then, I've heard nothing. And supposedly meetings will be taking place this week coming up to select new candidates. And I still haven't heard anything, nor any response from the GLU to the letter I've sent in, re in response to my suspension. Well, I'm really sorry that you're being treated like that, Darren. Mm. I'm hoping that people watching this will, uh, and I, I expect there probably are people from the Labour Party who watch this. I hope they're taking notice that we don't want we don't want the Labour Party to operate this way, and we need to restore trust and confidence in our members. And there's still time for them to undo this process and reinstate you as a councillor candidate, which I do think is really important for Bristol. I think you would never find this in a team building manual, would you, for an organisation <laughs> in a way to kind of infuse the troops or get things going mm. or, you know, sell ourselves to the electorate. <laughs> Let's do this internally. Mm. It's just not it's not a winning strategy. Is it? And, and all joking aside, there's nothing to show that the way that the party is being run at the moment is effective with the electorate. If you look at the polls at mm. the very least, least we could do you know we're not we're not doing well in the polls we've shrunk the membership we need more money coming in and then we really um we're putting off our members from activism but so although that might be happening from the top i want us to be a part of still trying to encourage membership and i know that you've had some really interesting ideas and campaigns that you've been a part of um if i come to you kevin first maybe you can give us some of the information about this recall conference with the, the final few minutes we've got left I think, I think uh, a lot of comrades are saying, you know, thinking, well, how do we go forward, you know, kind of particularly after the suspension of Corbyn in the, you know, in the back end of the autumn and then you're know, refusing to let him back into the parliamentary lay party. And, you know, there were calls coming up for, you know, uh, no confidence in the general secretary and, you know, some kind of suggesting that should be debated at the party conference in the autumn, hopefully it would take place autumn this year. But some comments felt that that was all well and good, but it's just too far off. You know, if we wait six months till September, October, who's going to be left, frankly, in the party? What, what will be left? And the, the, the situation, if we were to save the heart of the party and its ability to fight for working class people around policies to look after the needs of people in, in the crisis that we're living in now, the worst economic recession for 300 years, whatever you know, situation Labour government comes into, it's going to be one that's going to demand a socialist approach. And therefore, it, you know, we need to go further than waiting six months to question the general secretary. And so the demand rose up from, from below, really, for the idea of a recall, an immediate recall of Labour Party conference to discuss specifically two questions. No confidence in the general secretary and no confidence in the leader. And that call, I think, really has kind of coalesced in the last two or three weeks. I think um, the Baker's Union fire brigade and unite are actively discussing it and supporting it momentum the socialist campaign group of mps so it's now like a kind of a you know rolling snowball kind of gathering if you like it's pretty appropriate at the moment certainly for the scottish comrades that um you know it's, it's, it's picking up because people are thinking what hell can we do you know kind of to get this party back get our party back out of the hands of these people and it is a political question i mentioned that before because i remember when keir starmer's nomination meeting in Bristol, people supporting him were saying, well, he's made 10 pledges, you know, that basically are to continue the trajectory of the party, you know, the policies of the last three or four years that were forged under Jeremy Corbyn. And wherever you look online now, you'll find detailed evidence about eight of those 10 pledges have been out and out abandoned. So in other words, we have a leader that is actually, actually there on illegitimate terms. He made 10 pledges, Eight of them have been abandoned. Therefore, he's actually, um, you know, he's turned his back on people, many, probably many on the left even who voted for him, just feeling, well, let's try this and see what happens. And now people are feeling very angry about that and want the opportunity to reopen that discussion because he's there under false pretenses and he's not even doing a good job. Therefore, we need a recall conference to give the membership the opportunity to discuss whether they're happy with the leadership or they want to reopen the question now in good time. Well, you know, I'm all for putting uh, power back in the hands of the members and democracy is the point of this programme. Um, Jane, did you want to come in on that? Uh, yeah, I just, I don't know uh, whether anybody else uh, saw the interview, a, a double-page spread in yesterday's Times. I think it was yesterday. 
um, with Keir Starmer, and he was clearly quoted in that that it uh, he had he still had work to do within the Labour Party, exorcising that last the the last remnants of Corbynism. So you know he's up. It's it's it is a civil war within the Labour Party, and it's a civil war that wasn't started by the left. As everybody said, he got in uh, making false claims around these pledges, and they have been, uh, you know, they've been ruthless, the right wing, you know, they no niceties from them, you know, so, uh, you know, it, it can't be lobbed at us that we are causing uh, disunity. The disunity has come from the right. Let's be absolutely clear on that. So, yeah, I, I fully back this campaign for a recall conference, holding, you know, holding the leadership to account. You know, it's, you know, yes, we've had problems in Bristol, as other CLPs, but the main problem is at the top. You know, that's where it's coming from. Of course, the thing is, as well, in some of those articles I've seen from Keir, he stated that he thinks that most members are happy with things that are going on in the Labour Party. And I'm not sure there's been any statistical evidence to back that up. And it certainly doesn't mirror the feeling I get from the mm. members that I'm in regular contact with. So, of course, a conference would be a good way of getting back in touch with the views of the membership and maybe reasserting why we wanted those um, policies in the first place that, you know, the pledges that he stood on the platform of and, you know, refocusing, because an awful lot of people, as well as the way the party is being run, an awful lot of people are frustrated with the lack of policies in action. You know, in terms of the massive challenges we are facing at the moment, there is just a big vacuum in terms of answers being put forward to, to rise to these challenges, aren't there? So I think members would be enthused, and we could do with that even really ahead of the local elections, although I'm not sure it's coming in now. So, Darren, I know you've been really passionate about... Um, the Green New Deal policies. Can you see this recall conference as a, a way back in to get us talking about policies again as well? Well, I certainly hope so. The thing that we need to remember, well, there's two things we need to remember really. One is which is the Green New Deal is the most popular policy mm. in the modern Labour Party. It was submitted by more CLPs to the 2019 conference than any other policy has ever been submitted to the, to the Labour Party. It's overwhelmingly popular with every part of the Labour Party coalition and demographic, whether that's young people in urban centres or kind of the student rent stri the student strikers or people in former industrial towns where it should have seen manufacturing, good quality manufacturing jobs disappear. When Rebecca Long Bailey was touring the country selling the idea of the Green New Deal, she found it was overwhelmingly warmly received everywhere by every part of the coalition of the Labour Party. And the fact of the matter is, is that it is the only plausible solution to what is an existential crisis, a threat mm -hmm. to humanity. There is no other solution. It's just in, it's not possible to try to, to try to solve the climate crisis through kind of nudges and market mechanisms. We know that because history has shown that to be the, the case. So I think that the Labour Party can't really abandon a policy like the Green New Deal because there's a huge number of the voters of the Labour Party who are not especially attached. They're not kind of self-identified Labour members. It's not like a tribal identity. There are people who became attracted to the Labour Party because it became a vehicle for representing their views and for implementing the policies they want to see. And if the Labour Party isn't offering those policies, then they'll go elsewhere. We know that that's what's going to happen. So I think we do need to have an, an, another decision-making conference in which members get to assert their views because that's what a democratic party is. That's what the Labour Party is supposed to be. It's not, it's not like the, the Democrats in America, which is not a membership-based organisation. It's not a democratic organisation. The, the Labour Party is the members and it is the link with the trade unions. So... That's what I'd like to see more of. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So my message for everybody out there is, you know, we, we've discussed a lot of the problems that are going on in the Labour Party at the moment, but we've also given you this clear, solid action that you can get involved with creating potential change. So if people rejoin 
and get active in their CLPs. Or if you're still a member, get active in your CLP and get these motions passed so that we can call for a recall conference, reassert our commitment to policies like a Green New Deal. Like we recently did in Truro and Falmouth, all but two people were very confident in wanting to keep the socialist element to a Green New Deal. Because like Darren said, we can't, we cannot meet these challenges without socialism, without a Green New Deal. And even the very immediate threats that we're facing right now from, from COVID, you know, I think that there are many of us in the party, predominantly on the left, that are calling for a more cautious approach, a zero COVID approach, um, to dealing with this solution. So when we hear things like dates being set, laid in sand for like schools reopening, when scientists are saying we're not really there yet, it concerns me. And I feel like more democracy, more policy discussions, that would help us make better decisions, frankly. So, you know, if you are watching, don't be disheartened, get stuck in. Now is the time to get stuck in because your voices are needed more than ever. So just like to say a massive thank you to my three wonderful guests. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of Socialist Telly. Please give us some feedback. Let us know what you'd like us to cover more of or who you think would be good to have on. And uh,